Welcome to today's lecture in the module Horticultural Production Systems at the University of Bonn in the summer semester of 2020. My name is Eike Lüdling and today I want to talk to you about climate change and phenology modeling in horticulture. This is the first part of this lecture where I'm going to talk about climate change. What you see here is to me one of the most impressive illustrations of recent climate change that is currently around. What is shown here is global temperatures as a barcode. The colors here illustrate the, an the uh, mean annual temperature on our planet of a, well for um, all years since 1850, between 1850 and 2017. The overall range between dark blue, the coldest years, and dark red, the warmest years, is 1.35 degrees. While that may not, so not sound like a lot, what is alarming here is the distribution of these colors. You see that basically all the red, almost all the red bars here are clustered on the very right of the screen, which is the few decades that we have recently seen. So the current time is by far warmer than anything we have seen over the past 167 years. These temperature increases are frightening. Here you see a more conventional illustration of the same data set, and what is shown here is a temperature anomaly relative to 1951 to 1980, to the average of the period. Uh, so anything, in, any negative numbers here would mean cooler temperatures than the average, and anything positive, any, any positive numbers would mean higher than the average of that time period. And what you can basically see is that we have also here this steep increase in temperatures ever since about the 1950s, that's where it gets really dramatic, or maybe 1960s, 70s, and it is quite striking that if you look carefully here, we have since about 1977, 78, since about the time I was born, there hasn't been a single year when the global mean temperatures were below the average of the period 1951 to 1980. This is pretty alarming. Sometimes it also is also quite interesting to look at tables, look at actual numbers, not just as illustrations, because what you see here is the 10 globally warmest years on record. Since 1880, people have been recording temperatures in all kinds of places, and you can calculate a global average from this. And the 10 globally warmest years have all occurred since 2005. And in fact, 2005 is already a bit of an outlier. We have here, if you look, if you look at the numbers, uh, in ninth and 10th place, we have 2005 and 2009. All other years were, the, uh, were <laughs> occurred during the last decade. And the only years that are actually missing from that decade here are 2011 and 2012. The warmest six years were the past six years on record. So this is global. We can also look at Germany. The situation looks a little bit different. There, we also have one year from the 1990s year, 1994, came in seventh place. But all the other years, also here in the top 10, are from the 2000s. Yeah? 2002 at the bottom here, 2000 is somewhere in here, 2007. But also here, the warmest four years were very, very recent. 2019 is there, 2018, and then 2015 and 14. 2017 is also in the top 10. So also here you see that most of the really warm, by far warmest years that we've been seen, uh, that we've seen in Germany occurred over the past two decades, really. Now what is happening to our planet is global warming. The whole planet is warming. This warming is clearly visible and the evidence is unambiguous. There is no doubt that this is happening. What you see here on the top panel in this illustration is, again, the temperature an anomaly relative to 1961 to 1990. Uh, again, there's these lines that we've seen in the previous um, illustration already. But what I find almost more impressive is the decadal average in the lower panel. So that means the average temperature over every 10-year period. What you see here is that between, 19, uh, between 1850 and maybe 1920 or so, there wasn't so much difference, difference and went up and down a little bit. From 19, the 1920s, something started happening, slowed down a bit, but then from about, what is it, the 1980s, we have this step-like pattern. So every decade 
is something like 0.2 degrees warmer than the decade before. This is pretty strong evidence that something powerful is currently going on on our planet. As I mentioned, this warming is global. What you see here is observed change in surface temperature between 1901 and 2012. And you see warming occurred almost everywhere on Earth. All pixels here that are shown in, in shades of red or orange or purple are pixels where we have seen significant warming. Well, significant is actually the ones with the plus signs. You see that is almost everywhere where we have data. There's only one meaningful exception and that is in the North Atlantic. And that is actually also not necessarily good news. It may actually be rather bad news because what may be happening here is uh, that we're seeing an influx of fresh water, melting ice from Greenland and other parts of the Arctic. Now this leads to cooling of the water. It also leads to decreasing salinity. And what this may be triggering in turn is actually a slowing of the so-called global conveyor belt that basically drives all ocean circulations. The pump is essentially in the North Atlantic where we have, where we usually have very salty, very cold water that sinks down to the bottom of the ocean and basically drives this whole circulation of the ocean currents. If this slows down, we may be in for so-called positive feedbacks where climate change may get even more out of control than it already is. So even though we see this cooling here, we should not see this as a particularly reassuring sign. We have countless data sets that support these patterns that we're seeing here. There are thousands and thousands of weather stations around the world, most of which have uh, really supported this evidence. We see glaciers melting in different places. We see all kinds of signals in the, um, in the biosphere that support the notion that the climate is changing. Now, why would the climate be changing? Well, we know that there are quite a number of causes of warming and causes of temperature changes on our planet. Many factors influence the climate. The sun is certainly one. Aerosols are one, so small particles in the atmosphere. Volcanic eruptions have a pretty strong effect. Ozone in the atmosphere has an effect. This is all known. All of these things are well known to climate scientists. And what they have done is make models that simulate the effects that all of these different um, factors have. And you can see that here in this um, diagram. Where I'm going to find my laser pointer and show you what's going on here. What, what, is, what are we seeing here is the observed temperature here and the black line in the diagram. And what is shown in, in gray and, and with this, well, dark grayish, brownish line is what climate models have uh, reproduced. Yeah? So these models include all of these different factors that we know about and simulate the climate based on them. You see that they're pretty close to what has actually been observed. Not perfect, models almost never are, but pretty close. What we can also do with these models, though, is simulate the effect of the different factors that we know inf to influence the climate. So we can see the effect of the sulfates, purple line down here. Sulfates have increased in recent decades, mainly due to air pollution. Not a good thing, but in terms of climate, something that actually cools the planet. We know this. Sulfates have had a cooling effect. We know about volcanic eruptions at the green line here. Yeah, that sometimes we've had volcanic eruptions and sometimes pretty big ones, and they've cooled the globe for a certain while. And, and that's all known, and the effects are very well understood. We know the effect of ozone concentrations. Yeah, not so strong as you see here. We know what the sun is doing. Yeah, the sun has an influence, of course. There are the um, sunspot cycles, and sometimes the sun's a bit stronger and sometimes not so strong. We, we know all of these things. We also know that at the moment, the sun, well, actually this, this graph ends at about 1995. The sun was relatively strong then. Since then, it's become quite a bit weaker. 
The elephant in the room, however, and we understand that very well, is greenhouse gases. Without greenhouse gases, these um, observed temperature records here can never be simulated, at least not according to our understanding of how the climate system works. We absolutely need this greenhouse uh, gas signal in order to understand what's been happening. So we can, in, in, uh, we can quantify the influence of all these factors and without human influence, because we are the ones that are driving these, uh, con these concentration increases in greenhouse gases, we cannot explain what's been observed. Greenhouse gases are the primary culprits for, for recent warming. And we should not be surprised that this is happening because concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased strongly over the past approximately 150 years, as you can see here. Ever since we started industrializing our societies, these, temp these concentrations have, have gone up quite dramatically. And it's not only CO2, which you see here in the upper diagram, that's gone up for sure, but we see the same thing here for methane, another greenhouse gas, and also for nitrous oxides. The red graph down here is also a, a um, greenhouse gas. And together those, I mean, there are some other greenhouse gases, but together these make up the bulk of what is causing global warming. All of these have increased strongly in their concentrations, and the source of all of them is obvious. Human activity in particular from the burning of fossil fuels. And you can see this here. These are the human emissions of anthropogenic um, CO2. This is just the carbon dioxide here and none of the other gases as far as I can see. Uh, and you see that this has been going up really dramatically. Starting in about the 1850s, I mentioned already, this has something to do with industrialization, but the pace of this process has, has increased dramatically since about the end of World War II. Since about the 1950s, this has really gone, um, this has skyrocketed basically. And you can see some, well, it's not all fossil fuels. The, the brown part here, the brown area at the, at the bottom here is forestry and other land uses. Deforestation has had quite an influence here. Agriculture also to some extent. But the bulk of this is fossil fuels, cement and flaring. So flaring is the burning of natural gas as it comes out of the earth. And this is where the CO2 emissions come from. Here you see the same data set, the global CO2 emissions in billion tons here, distributed by world regions. I mean, first of all, you can see that the international emissions, the sum of all of this, have consistently been rising and are currently at an all-time peak. They've never been as high as now. We, have a, we had about 37.1 billion tons in 2018, and that was 3% more than the year before. Despite regional progress, there's still, there are still dramatic increases. Still, it is, it is worth looking at the different regions here. Maybe to some extent we see the biggest emitter is China. China, of course, produces a lot of the world's consum consumer goods now and technology and all those things. So it's not totally fair to blame this all on China, but this is where most of the emissions currently um, originate. Second largest is the United States and then possibly Asia Pacific here, uh, which is Australia largely, um, but then also the European Union is a big emitter. Of course, these are many countries and also many people. And um, while well, we have also seen a bit, of a, a bit of progress here in terms of reducing emissions, it has something to do with industrial decline in some parts of the Union, but there is also a bit of a success story in here in terms of um, converting our electricity production to solar energy. So it's quite easy to look at historic climate change and historic emissions. But of course, when we make plans currently, the, the science we do, the planning we do, refers to the future. We want to do things in the future and we have to have an idea of how the climate is developing and the greenhouse gas emissions are developing in the future. This is why climate scientists use future scenarios and at the moment they are using the so-called representative concentration pathways, the so-called RCPs. 
They're going to be superseded soon by a different type of scenario, but that's not what I'm talking about um, yet. So here you see these RCPs, and what, what is shown here is the annual greenhouse gas emissions um, according to different uh, climate models here. This is always a, well, each of these shaded areas here represents a population of climate models and emissions models, and um, these are summarized by these, by these ranges here. What's shown here is the, the four main RCPs that are in use, the so-called RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6.0, and 8.5. And these describe possible future scenarios of greenhouse forcing. You know, forcing is the, well, the warming effect that these gases have on the planet. They have funny names, and this is because they are named after the radiative forcing that's expect, expected by the an, end of the 21st century. This is in watts per square meter, so it's 8.5 watts per square meter in addition to what we currently have for the uh, RCP 8.5 scenario, for example. What do you have to know is that these, of course, reflect different levels of optimism about our ability to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. 8.5 is often termed the business as usual scenario, is a scenario where we don't do much at all about climate change and emissions keep going up and for that reason global warming reaches pretty extreme dimensions. RCP 2.6 however is a contrasting scenario where we make rapid progress in reducing our emissions. So this is what we probably should be doing which we, but we may not actually achieve. Doesn't, it doesn't look like it at the moment. We'll probably be somewhere between those two, those two scenarios, maybe on the 4.5 track, maybe on the 6.0 track. But which track we're on can make a pretty major difference. What you see here is predicted temperatures for the end of the 21st century compared to the 1986 to 2005 baseline here now, according to these two contrasting representative concentration pathways, the 2.6 on the left and the 8.5 on the right. And you see that we see dramatic warming in all of these scenarios, in both scenarios, but, um, well, actually somewhat, ma it seems somewhat manageable if you look on, the, look on the left. We see the warming level that's expected here, something between, well, maybe one and one and a half degrees for the whole planet. And that is something that many scientists think, well, we can probably handle this. What you see on the right here is unchecked climate change. And we're seeing here the global average, probably something like four or five degrees more than we have when they had it at the, at the end of the 20th century, and in, especially in the Arctic here, we see a t in, a, an amount of warming that would dramatically upset all ecosystems in that region. The consequences of this for our planet are something we can't even properly model and imagine now because it's such a different world from what we're currently experiencing. This is something we should absolutely try to avoid. What is much harder to project is future precipitation. Changes are much less clear here and the projections vary quite a bit among climate models. You can imagine global warming, temperatures increasing globally means temperatures in most places will also be increasing, but what this means for the water cycle is usually much less clear. But you can, there are still projections of this and you can see them here. Once again, for RCP 2.6 on the left and RCP 8.5 on the right. And these are always the, um, also in the temperature diagram that we looked at before, these are summaries of projections by lots of climate models. So in this case, on the left, we see a summary of 32 model runs on the uh, right of 39. That's a small number in the corner. And what's shown here is the changes in, in, temp in precipitation in percent uh, compared to a baseline of uh, for the end of the 20th, um, so basically end of 20th century versus end of 21st century. 
Everything shown in green here means increasing rainfall. Anything in orange and reddish colors would mean a decrease. Now all areas here that show this hatching, so these diagonal lines, are those with relatively minor changes. And the ones that have no symbols at all are the ones where the models aren't really in agreement. Now where we see the dots, though, in these maps are places where the models are in agreement and we can be fairly confident that certain things will be happening. It's not so much for the RCP 2.6 because the climate signal is relatively mild, but on the right side here we see lots of areas with these the in, well marked by these dots, and these are areas where we can be pretty sure that certain things will be happening. And the most dramatic thing here, probably also from our point of view, is we're expecting a fairly significant drying of the Mediterranean climates of this world in under this high emission scenario by the end of the 21st century. And of course, even if we don't actually see this extreme rise in carbon in, in greenhouse gas concentrations, even moderate levels of global warming um, will cause a, a certain degree of such changes and we will, many people on this planet will have to prepare for these, um, these impacts. It is also important to remember that warming will not end in 2100. We quite often see these climate change projections for the end of the 21st centuries that almost make it look like, well, that's the worst that's going to happen. Not the case, of course. CO2 remains in the atmosphere for a long time, and much of this will still be around in 2100 and even for centuries afterwards. Future temperature increases are locked in by what we're doing right now. And on a business as usual trajectory, the warming that our planet may experience may reach somewhere between 3 and 13 degrees by, to, by the year 2300. Well, you may say that's centuries in the future, but we really have to ask ourselves whether it would be responsible behavior of ours to basically mess up the world for our descendants of what may be 10 generations from now. But we also, I think, need imagery, maybe, to imagine what such temperature changes even mean. Sometimes when we hear, well, one and a half degrees more, three degrees more, it doesn't sound that scary. Because, of course, this is the sort of temperature change we experience all the time between seasons. When we travel somewhere, we may have such, such differences. But what does it actually mean to see such changes on a global scale? It is actually hard to tell what this will mean, because we're entering new climatic territory, so to speak. What you see here is the concentration in atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide over the past 400,000 years, 440,000 years or so. That's shown in blue here. And while you can see that this, is, this went up and down quite a bit over the millennia, and all of a sudden now, at the very end of this figure here, we see a dramatic and pretty sudden increase. Yeah, we see these, these changes here have happened in the past all the time, but now basically we have here a, compared to, well, considering the time scale we're looking at, an almost vertical increase. So we're going straight up to levels that by far exceed what we have seen in the past. Yeah, and CO2 is already greater now than it has ever been since the origin of humanity, which is, well, probably some, somewhere a bit, a bit further back than this, but uh, not all that much further back. And what we also know is that there's always been a correlation between, um, well, CO2 has never been rising so fast meaning to say that. Uh, and we know that there's a correlation between these CO2 levels and temperature. So this is the, the red bar, the red graph here at the bottom is the global, or is the temperature actually, I think the temperature in Antarctica in this case, because this is where the data is from. This is from an ice core in the Antarctic. Um, and uh, well, we know that there is a relationship between CO2 and, and temperature. Of course, it could be both ways. It could also be that rising temperatures 
lead to rising CO2. It's also, of course, statistically possible that these um, type series have nothing to do with each other. But from, from physical experiments, we know pretty pretty well, and also from what we can observe on other planets, we know very well that there is this correlation between the two, and that, drive, that rising CO2 levels lead to an increase in temperature. And as I mentioned, we are in new in uncharted territory in terms of basically effects of carbon dioxide and temperature on our species, on humans. And we can even look at longer timescales and find the same thing. What's shown here is the global surface temperature, so not CO2 levels here, but global surface, surface temperature over time. And we see and we often hear that argument, oh, temperature has always been changing, and that's certainly true. Um, temperature has been quite a bit warmer than it is currently. Now, right now we have a global mean temperature is written here of about 14.5 degrees Celsius. And yes, it's been something like 27, 28 degrees in the past. However, this is 50 million years ago. Yeah, at the beginning, well, this is a million years now. At the beginning of this figure, the dinosaurs went extinct. Uh, this is how far back we go here. And we see that after this peak here in temperatures in the Eocene, so about 50 million years ago, we've had a slow decrease in temperature that's basically been continuing ever since, ever since today. We also understand very well what has been has been driving these changes. Some of them were pretty large scale uh, patterns in terms of ocean circulation, for example. Here, for example, we know that 50 million years ago, India and Asia collided. So India was separate in the beginning, then it rammed into, into Asia, the Himalaya started folding up, and that unfolded a certain climatic dynamic um, that changed the game a bit in terms of climate. Um, at some point, we had the um, Antarctic separating from uh, Australia, no, I think South America, um, leading to the for formation of a circumpolar current, so a um, current, ocean current that circulates around the Antarctic, which is really only the time when Antarctica became so so cold and the ice sheet started forming. We know at some point in history the Isthmus of Panama closed, so there was a actually an opening between the Americas uh, for a long time. When this closed, the ocean currents changed again, and when ocean currents change on a large scale, it always leads to changes in the heat distribution on the planet. So this again had an effect leading ultimately to this, uh, well, recent decline here in temperature. What we also know is that there has been a decline in CO2 concentrations ever since the Eocene, those it's written here, causing a slow Xenozoic, so this is about this era that we're living in now, um, climate trend, long-term cooling trend until now. And what's shown here, the very last part of this figure is the lifespan of the hominins, so of humans. And we still have seen this, this decreasing decline here, and we, you can tell that this is roughly here the um, warmest temperatures that humans have had to endure so far on a global level. There is quite a bit of variation here that's basically caused by the ice ages, but that's, that's really what, what this is here. This, this is the difference between ice age and warm age. But that's, that's roughly the range that we're comfortable with. And now we're causing a an increase that could be anything between a pretty small arrow here, small increase, and some pretty extensive ones. So these, of course, especially the long arrow here, would propel us way out of the temperature range that we know we can endure without any problems. Now let's look at what such changes in global temperature actually mean. Again, it's hard to imagine. Um, well, it's easy for us to imagine what it, what, what it means to ourselves experience five degrees less or five degrees more. Um, but let's see what this means on a planetary level. And it's pretty frightening what this means. The last time we had five degrees less than we are, we are experiencing right now, we were in an ice age. And this is what Europe looked like at the time. You see the white part up here 
in, in Scandinavia, or where Scandinavia is now, is all glaciers. Northern Germany, many large parts of Europe were covered under ma by massive ice sheets. Sea level was about 120 meters lower than it is currently. This is what five degrees colder means. Well, we're not so interested in five degrees colder when it comes to climate change. We're concerned about five degrees warmer. So what does that mean? Well, we have to go back a bit further to see a world that was five degrees warmer than we, what we currently have. But if we go 13 million years back, we can find such a world in the Miocene. This is what Europe looked like then. Of course, 13 million years is a long time and all kinds of other things have also changed. The continental positions have maybe slightly changed, but not in a way that would really make much of a difference. Most of this difference here between the current map and what we're seeing here is because of sea level, sea level rise. Five degrees is serious business and it actually would lead to the melting of a large part of what is uh, currently um, of, the, of the water that's currently uh, fixed in the ice sheets of our planet and the glaciers. Even one and a half degrees is a pretty strong scenario. Even that will have changes that we will have a hard time adjusting to. And of course, such changes have happened before. I mean, we see this map here. This is, of course, not a not a, not a satellite image from 13 million years ago. It's a reconstruction. We've had such changes before, but much, much slower. In terms of ge ge geological time scale, what we're currently doing to our planet is almost instantaneous. And so we may already be living in an unstable world because the greenhouse forcing that's currently, that we're currently already experiencing will eventually lead to a new stable state that is quite different from what we're currently seeing. And we should really try to avoid this because we don't actually know what the consequences of this will be. To some extent, we have models, we have some idea of what's going to happen. And in the second part of this lecture, when we talk about phenology models, we'll get into that a bit. Um, but these models aren't particularly good. We don't really know. And the, what the models are already telling us is that we should be seriously concerned. We will not be able to keep on living our lives. At least, at least, not many people in the, on this planet will not be um, well continuing our lives the way we have in the past. But of course, there are things we can do. Not all is lost. We have our future largely in our own hands, um, because emissions and temperatures are correlated. We know this pretty well and climate models and climate science in general have a very good understanding of how these things are, are um, related. And future temperatures depend very strongly on our emissions. And for every level of warming, you, know, you see the you see the warming here on the um, on the y-axis, this is the temperature anomaly relative to 1861 to 1880. We see zero here at the at the bottom and then going all the way to five degrees here and under extreme warming scenarios. Um, each level of warming here can be related to a cumulative total uh, man-made CO2 emissions amount um, compared to, well, relative to the, uh, well, since, since 1870. So that what was seen, seen, uh, shown on the um, x-axis here is the total CO2 emissions by humanity since 1870. We know we've already emitted quite a bit. Um, we're somewhere, somewhere here, at like 400, 450 or so um, gigatons carbon, and we know what's going to happen if we keep if we keep emitting. Now, the international community in the Paris Agreement has decided that we want to try and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, which is somewhere here. Now, this means if we take our model seriously, that the total amount of human um, CO2 emissions can only be, well, somewhere around here, right? So you start here at 1.5, we go over here, and then we end up somewhere on this scale. There is uncertainty, this is a pretty large area here, but we know that we'll be roughly in this, in this uh, ballpark here. 
if we want to reach the goals that we've set ourselves in the Paris Agreement, we have to reduce our emissions. And it's while well, knowing the relationship between temperature and CO2 emissions, it's quite straightforward to identify pathways that will lead us to acceptable um, total emissions levels. And it really means that emissions must come down very quickly. At the latest in 2060, we must be CO2 neutral. So there cannot be any more increases in global, global carbon dioxide concentrations. Here we have a few pathways that can lead us to this point. And all of them are pretty ambitious. You remember from what I showed you earlier, we had, um, so far we've had pretty rapidly increasing CO2 concentrations to something like this, or CO2 emissions to something like this here, about 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. And now we have to come down. We have to come down almost as quickly as we've gone up, or even more quickly. This, of course, will require a massive change in the way we do business. It is also quite obvious that the longer we delay, the more quickly will this um, will this decrease have to happen. If we started, if we had started now, well, maybe we are starting now um, with the current coronavirus crisis and uh, accordingly reducing emissions. Um, if we started now, we we could still maybe take a bit of time and make it maybe to zero emissions somewhere here. If we keep increasing our emissions even longer, then the decline will have to be steeper than that. What's shown in this figure is also a few scenarios that are, um, well, basically in shown in gray here that uh, have a relatively high overshoot, meaning that we go beyond our budget first and then eventually find some sort of technology that will sequester carbon again and so we'll have massive neg negative uh, emissions so sequestering removing co2 from the atmosphere however the technology for this has not been developed and there are serious doubts scientifically whether this is even feasible but regardless of what exactly um, the goal is what level of warming we think we think we can tolerate we should be aware that every ton of CO2 that we blow into the atmosphere makes humanity's future worse. So we should really not be looking for the cheapest way to reach the um, minimum emissions targets that we can possibly negotiate with the international community. We should try to do this as quickly and as completely as we can. Of course, this will have a cost and, well, some Disadvantages may result from these emissions reductions, but we should really try to do this as well as we can. So are we doing everything we can to reduce emissions? Arguably not. And the reason for this has a lot to do with the relationships between truth and manipulation. The truth is, well, what the truth is, scientists can really never tell. But in terms of climate change, we are quite sure that we're pretty close to the truth. Science is sure, and it's been, it, it has stated that very clearly with the uh, reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that the global climate is changing, and that this is frightening, and that we should be doing something about it. But not everyone agrees with that and there have been powerful forces delaying action on climate. I'm talking about the so-called climate skeptics, because there are a number of questions that we keep hearing. Is the Earth really warming? Are we really to blame? Is this our fault? Isn't this all much too uncertain? Can we even do anything about it? Can we stop global warming? Isn't this much too expensive? And aren't there some evil powers, governments, or even greedy scientists, or maybe other dark forces behind the climate hysteria? Now, science has given clear answers to all of these questions. And again, the IPCC reports are probably the best summary on the scientific state of the art on any sort of topic in the modern age, or of all times, really. Yes, the Earth is really warming. 
we are to blame. It is clearly anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions that are the main driver of climate change. There is uncertainty, for sure, but there's enough certainty to act. It seems much less likely than business that business as usual is going to allow a livable future for our society. So the risks are so great and the certainty is certainly sufficient to be able to uh, well justify decisive action on climate. We can do something about it, that is clear. Most of the emissions come from the burning of fossil fuels and energy transition to a different type of fuel will make a huge difference. This may be expensive, maybe, but first of all, we have no alternative. And second, I'm not even so sure this is going to be so expensive. Because at the moment, I mean, we use fossil fuels for supplying our energy, which is expensive, which costs, causes all kinds of environmental problems. Of course, we have to pay a lot for fossil fuels. We're seeing that regenerative energies, renewable power is going down in price. In many cases, in many applications, it is already cheaper than the fossil fuels. This does not even have to be all that expensive. There are no evil powers at work here. But there are rather obvious efforts to manipulate the public opinion. And these are not the efforts of Greta Thunberg or some evil scientists. Um, they are somewhere else. And the question we have to ask ourselves is why are these questions still so prominently discussed in the public, public arena if, this, if the science is really so clear? Let me first talk briefly about a certain topology of climate change denial tactics. There's so-called five stages of climate change denial, uh, which have been uh, well described like this. Stage one is that you deny that the problem even exists. So climate change is a hoax made up by the Chinese, as Donald Trump has, well, is on the record as saying it uh, at some point. Stage two is you, you deny that we're the cause. There's also a stage 2b, consensus denial where you may say, well, some scientists may think so, but there's also some other scientists who don't think so, which, uh, well, there may be true. There's a handful of other scientists who doubt this, um, this conclusion, but they're usually not particularly credible. They're often not actual climate scientists at all and have no, no recognizable expertise on the matter, but somehow always get pushed to uh, the front line of political debates as the dissenters uh, in, in the, in the um, climate science arena. Stage three is that you deny it's a problem. So you may argue that, oh, global warming is great because I don't like winter anyway, um, which is maybe a, a step further. Um, at least you've recognized that climate change is happening, but it still is a um, misinterpretation of well, what, what the science, science, scientific consensus on the implications of climate change really is. Stage four is that you deny that we can solve it. There's nothing we can do about it. We have to live with the way um, things are. And so all, all we can do is adapt to the changes that are coming our way. Stage five, then it's too late. We can't do anything about it anymore. Uh, you can see in, the, in this cartoon, this illustrates quite nicely how uh, the debates are often often go. Yeah? Climate action and time as temperatures rise, it's always too soon, too soon, till, still too soon to do anything about climate change until eventually it's too late. And you've always had a nice excuse for not doing anything about climate change. It is quite insightful to look at who benefits from the status quo. So who benefits from the processes that are causing climate change? The obvious beneficiary is everyone who has anything to do or who makes money with fossil fuels and their consumption. About one third of all emissions can be traced back to just 20 companies, private and state-owned one, state ones. And you can see in this, in this figure here, you can see the um, investor-owned, so the private companies are the yellow ones and the state-owned ones are the black ones. And the big one, the biggest one here is Saudi Aramco. So this, this is a, a company owned by the Saudi Arabian government and 
if you've been following climate negotiations at all, you know that it's the Saudi government that's been one of the major um, breaks, basically, the, the major detractors in international climate negotiations, the ones who always try to stop progress. We have Chevron here, a private company, Gazprom, Russian government, a major source of income for Russia. ExxonMobil, another big oil company. Iran is here. And BP, Royal Dutch Shell, Indi an Indian coal company, not quite sure where Pemex is from, but Venezuela is one, uh, China. Yeah. So you see this mix mixture of pretty powerful uh, interests that are um, located in, in various points, uh, well, loca uh, regions of the world, are sort of a, well, have formed sort of a cartel, it seems, to block um, progress on climate change. There's been a lot of action to stop any meaningful uh, change by, by all of these actors. And here's a, here are a few numbers for you on these efforts. Lobbying expenses of major oil companies. These are only private ones here. And you can see that the five biggest ones here combined uh, ha have uh, spent a total of 201 million years a um, million US dollars per year uh, on climate lobbying. I'm not quite sure about over what time span, but this is about the level in 2019. BP 23, uh, 53 million dollars, Shell 49, ExxonMobil 41, the others a little bit less. This is a lot of money for basically just influencing policies uh, political processes that try to regulate fossil fuel consumption. Of course, lobbying isn't necessarily always bad. If you're if you're interested in like a real good, really good cause, nature conservation, or whatever whatever it may be, women's rights, lobbying is almost a virtuous thing. It's less virtuous if you're actually lobbying for something you don't believe in. And this has recently gained some prominence by the hashtag Exxon New. Because there's been an, uh, what, what's been uncovered is an early analysis of the relationship between greenhouse gases and climate by scientists that belonged to the oil giant Exxon. And this assessment almost completely matches the current expectations of the climate science community. So here's a figure from this from this graph. I think it came out in 1982, so that's quite a long time ago. And what we see here is well, time on the um, time on the x-axis here, starting in 1960, and then going all the way to 2100, and the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration, and the average temperature increase here on the um, on the other y-axis, and um, Basically, what, what they've seen here, what they've shown here, is this, this increase here in both carbon dioxide concentration and temperature. This is pretty much aligned with what, current, uh, what scientists are currently thinking this relationship is. Here's another figure from the same report. Again, we have the change in the global mean temperature here in, Kel in Kelvin, but that's basically the same as degrees uh, Celsius by time. Um, and we have here this, actually uncertainties are already um, captured in this, in this figure. We have the range of natural fluctuations in climate, so that's the climatic noise that's shown by this arrow here. And then the expected range of fluctuations if we include the CO2 uh, effect. Yeah? So uncertainty is again indicated here, but we see that the expectations by 2100, according to these Exxon scientists, is something like warming on the order of 2 to 3 degrees Celsius. What we have here is a serious case of dishonest communication. Because of course it may be possible that well this huge company of Exxon had like maybe a handful of scientists who wrote this report and it wasn't actually known to anyone else in the company. But that's not the case, as has been somewhat recently shown by a large analysis on cl of climate-related documents by Exxon. 
Here's a summary of positions taken, and this was a paper by Supran and Oreskes. Naomi Oreskes is in particularly a pretty renowned um, uh, well, science historian who's, who's uh, dug, dug into these, um, the, the communications by Exxon here. And let me explain this illustration here, which uh, I, I changed a bit to make it fit on the slide, but uh, it's a bit complex maybe. But what we have here is basically two statements. Um, that documents can either agree on or not, agree with or not. Climate change is real and caused by humans, and climate change is a serious problem. And then we have four different types of documents here by Exxon. One is internal communications, so within the company. Then we have peer-reviewed scientific papers, which they also write. I mean, they actually do contribute to climate science and make pretty useful contributions even. They also write non-peer-reviewed science, and they also write so-called advertorials. So this is things like full-page ads in the New York Times. I think these were all actually collected from the New York Times. Exxon publishes a lot there, apparently. Um, now, the colors here indicate different things. Gray means no position is taken on the issue. Green, bluish, is uh, acknowledgement of the statement here. For example, that climate change is real and caused by humans. Humans, The dashed green line is acknowledgement, including reasonable doubt. So there's always been reasonable doubt. I mean, scientists are never totally sure, or very rarely. So there's always been some uncertainty that was certainly justified to highlight. Black means acknowledge and doubt. Gray dashed lines is reason just reasonable doubt, so doubt that yeah is somewhat justified, and red is doubt. Yeah, so basically, we're just expressing doubt in these statements that are indicated here. Now, the important thing to take take away from here is that in the internal communications, and also in the peer-reviewed science, yeah, so the part that uh, the public doesn't really get to see so much we have an overwhelming agreement with kind of the, the mainstream conclusions from climate science. Climate change is real and caused by humans. That is predominantly what these internal communications have shown. Peer-reviewed science certainly as well, because, well, if in peer-reviewed science you don't normally get away with saying things that are, um, well, go against the scientific mainstream. In their external communications, the non-peer-reviewed ones, where no other critical scientists were looking at, and especially in the advertorials, so in the messages to the public, we see almost exclusively doubt. This is all almost all read, so basically every full-page ad in the New York Times was aimed at doubting these statements. Climate change is not real and is not caused by humans was the message that they transported in their external communications. And the same thing is on climate change is a serious problem. This has led these, um, well, these journalists and, well, many people in the, uh, the, the public sphere to really uh, have concerns about the honesty of, of this company. And it is quite obvious that, I mean, obviously every company has to do risk assessment. What are the risks to my business? And and also, well, what possible liabilities are, that are coming up? What what damage are we actually causing? So they require this these internal assessment. That's why they have climate scientists in the first place. They need to know what damage they're causing. They found out certain things um, that they certainly are using internally, but what they communicate to the outside, outside world and especially towards politicians is pretty much the opposite. This study is from the same paper and showing basically the same findings, just in a slightly different uh, type of illustration here. Once again, we have um, three uh, statements about climate change. That climate change is real and man-made again. Climate change is serious and climate change is solvable. And here we, here we see the share of documents of the internal communication, the peer-reviewed, non-peer-reviewed, and then these uh, advertorials. 
And you see that in every case, we see a dramatic increase in the percentage of, of papers that uh, communicate doubt about these statements when it comes to the, um, the advertorials. Yeah, so that is um, climate change is real and man-made was basically almost not questioned by any internal communications, but in 80% of the statements that went out to the public. Climate change is serious. Internally, not really a big topic, but in, what is it, 60% of um, the advertorials, this was doubted. Climate change is solvable. Also, in about 60% of the advertorials, this, this uh, position is doubted, whereas in the internal communication, the peer-reviewed and the non-peer-reviewed science, especially the peer-reviewed papers, this is a negligible uh, percentage only. So what we see here is a striking contrast between the internal and the external commun uh, communications. So what we see have here basically is a, uh, an illustration of the communication strategy as it uh, presents itself. We have the internal documents here. Internally, ExxonMobil acknowledged a long time ago that anthropogenic global warming is the business threat and at least uncertainties, and it looks like th something is going to change. Um, there is certainly an, an intera interaction here with the peer review publications. Of course, they are in, informed by the internal documents, but they also inform the, um, well, the internal position that the company is taking. But then there's this contrast. What goes out to the public is the opposite. Uh, ExxonMobil's advertorials overwhelmingly express doubts that anthropogenic global warming is real, human caused, serious, or solvable. Yeah, this has been admitted in scientific and internal communications, but not um, towards, the, towards the outside world. Um, well, towards, uh, that uh, global warming is happening and is a problem. What's shown also here is a another pillar of the communication strategy, that is outside lobbying. Um, and well, actually, this one here: other in, uh, inside and outside lobbying to influence policy and legislation, both both directly and through third-party organizations. And this may actually have been the more powerful part of this company's communication strategy. And not only this company is actually a lot of the real dark forces of at least uh, the um, climate science debate are taking a, a slightly different route towards influencing public policy and public opinion. And that is through the so-called, or what, I, what I'm calling them, the organized skeptics. There's a pretty substantial network of institutes um, with all kinds of different names, things like the American Enterprise Institute, uh, as you can see here um, in the center, that's a pretty big one. We have the so-called donors trust where people can put money and have it funneled to these different uh, institutes, institutes um, the Hoover institutions and the Hoover Institution and uh, various others, Americans for Prosperity, the Heartland Institute is particularly, particularly dark force. Um, so these orange ones here, orange dots are mainly kind of sort of research or kind of think tanks, research organizations. And then the blue ones here are sources of money, like the Mercer Family Foundation or various other kind of private people here um, that maybe some of you, you recognize, but many of them we wouldn't necessarily know as uh, Europeans or as Germans. But these are many of them are well known uh, American families with ties to the to the oil industry. Uh, so there's lots of oil and coal money flowing in this into this network here of think tank and public opinion influencers, so to say. Um, and most of the science that comes out of this is highly questionable. There's a lot of kind of strong, forceful communications with a very questionable scientific scientific backing. Um, and some of these people have been termed, again, by Naomi Oreskes in, in a book she's written, the merchants of doubt. Uh, so there are some, also some prominent scientists who somehow made it into their mission 
to diffuse the scientific consensus, not only in climate, not only on climate change, they all, they've also undermined all kinds of other environmental uh, regulation, especially in the UN, US, but not only there. They've basically been working to undermine the scientific consensus and give those interests that are benefiting from things being well in a somewhat state, a sad state of affairs. They've given those people an excuse for um, not suffering from any sort of legislative action to control their, their doings. But fortunately, we're not in the US here. So do we not have this problem? Well, Germany also has a vibrant and lively skeptic community. And unfortunately, that's particularly painful for me. The, uh, the major organization behind the German climate change denial propaganda is an institute called Europäisches Institut für Klima und Energie, acronym is EICE, which also happens to be my first name, even though I couldn't disagree more with anything, pretty much anything they say. What they present here, what they present on their website, and what they disseminate throughout, even through throughout, well, into into certain um, policy policy making cycles here in Germany, and, and they really try try to push their agenda in many places. But it's a barely it's a bizarrely distorted representation of science. Uh, there's hardly anything that is that is really credible here. And um, climate change is basically presented as a conspiracy, conspiracy by hard to say who really. Again, greedy scientists or some communists who want to regulate your life and, and, and things like that. And the goal is clearly the manipulation of public opinion and probably the defense of, of some, uh, well, some people who are making money off the situation being, being as it currently is. And unfortunately, this communication has found quite a few takers, um, especially if you if you're looking through social media discussion rooms, it is rather frightening um, what kind of opinions many people out there at least uh, pretend to be holding on climate change. So there's really been a bit of a fight for the truth uh, recently, and there's lots of uh, manipulative, manipulative communication on the internet, especially in social media. And it's frustrating for many scientists because we're not usually in the business of pushing our findings onto, uh, onto, onto people's desktops or smartphones, but that is certainly what the other side has been pretty good at doing. Um, for example, if you Google this Exxon New hash hashtag in, um, well, if you put that into Google, here are the, the first, um, what is it, uh, nine results that come up. You see the first one, the very first one here, uh, that comes up is a um, an ad, a paid ad by ExxonMobil, probably, um, from their corporate website. Uh, don't be misled. Understanding the facts, and if you look at this, this is a, actually a defense of the company. The next three hits are allegations. So basically, these are websites that well tell the story of how Exxon has been misleading the public and then the, the the next five are a mix a mix of the of the two among the next five we once again have have, have three articles that are basically defending defending Exxon uh, but you, and you, and you can you can look at the sources it's Exxon itself it's Forbes magazine so business friendly magazine it's the New York Post which is a um, i believe Rupert Murdoch owned uh, newspaper in New York, so one that is, has always been arguing against any sort of uh, climate, uh, well, environmental legislation. So there are certain certain news outlets, certain uh, well, uh, actors in the media out there that are trying to, well, basically uh, retell the history, distort the facts, and make it seem like climate change is not happening, is not a problem, or, well, can't be solved, and going through these five stages of denial. Now, um, what do we all, I mean, we all have to somehow live in this kind of world where it's often a little bit unclear what the facts are and what the lies are. And what we can really only do for ourselves is to decide who is more credible. And to me, the question, the first question I would, that follows from this is who actually has financial stakes in this debate? 
Is it Greta and El Gore and the IPCC scientists? Is it the wind power industry, the solar power industry? Is it millions of teenagers and young people who are taking to the street to stop climate change? Is it the United Nations? Or is it possibly these guys, fossil fuel companies, coal companies, I don't know what the AFD really has to do with this. They're probably just tools <laughs> of these other forces. Is it is it Donald Trump? Who knows? To me, to me, it's relatively clear who is uh, who are the good guys in this debate and who aren't. Uh, but everyone, I guess, has to somehow make up their own minds. So that's what I wanted to say on climate change. Horticultural production systems isn't really all about climate change only. So the next thing I will say, I will uh, tell you about, but it'll be in a separate presentation, is how we model phenology in horticulture to, among other things, understand the impacts of climate change on fruit trees.